Hello, and welcome back to The Road to 2000. My name is Caleb Denby, and as always, I'm your driver on this journey. Um, so today, the topic I wanted to cover is a little bit about more, as always, chess improvement. So there are a lot of different ways to improve at chess, but uh, you know, there's certain stigmas around it. Something you might have heard is, or something you might think is the best way to improve at chess is to lock yourself in a room and do tactics for 24 hours a day, and then emerge two months later a chess genius. But uh, it turns out that's not so much the way it actually happens. And so uh, chess can actually be a very social game. And one of the best ways to improve, even when you're seriously training chess, is to do it with your friends. And so I wanted to go over uh, a little bit about my process for that, of working with one of my friends, and go over some games that we played, some training games, and see where we made improvements and how it can actually help you uh, in your games uh, to improve at chess. So let's take a look here. I was playing my friend uh, Samuel Padja, who used to be my teammate on the U of Illinois uh, chess team. And he's about 2300 USCF, I believe. And he plays the Benoni, which is an opening I've struggled with. And so I thought it'd be great to play some training games with him in the Benoni. So let's see what happens. Uh, d4, knight f6, c4, c5, d5, e6, knight c3, e takes, c takes, uh, d6. And so we have a pretty normal starting position in the Benoni. I uh, continued with knight f3, played g6, and I played here bishop g5. And so this was a new line that I wasn't so sure uh, how to play just yet. I didn't know all the details. Uh, this is a line that actually was recommended to me by Robert Hingoski, so I figured it's probably pretty good, but uh, it's a great chance to kind of work out some kinks in your opening repertoire. Uh, this is what uh, these training games can really be good for. Uh, Samuel played bishop g7. I continued with e3. So I did know that white probably shouldn't commit to e4 just yet and uh, give himself a little bit more time to get his pieces developed. Black simply castled. I played knight to d2. And this is another idea that I had picked up on in this opening. I could play bishop e2 first, but maybe that allows black the chance to play bishop g4. And uh, something I do know about Benoni's, I'm not sure if you're familiar, uh, one of Black's biggest problems is his lack of central space. And so what do you want to do when you have a lack of space? Do you know? What's one of the biggest things? Trade pieces. Yeah, you want to trade pieces. And it so happens in the Benoni uh, that Black has enough space for about three minor pieces. And so if he manages to trade off just one, it's usually quite beneficial to his position. Uh, so I played knight to d2 here, avoiding bishop g4. Uh, knight to d7, bishop e2, rook e8. And now I played this move, knight to c4. So what do you guys think about this move? Just in general, or any specific thoughts that you might be, you might think are good about it, or maybe wrong with it. Puts pressure on d6. Yeah, that's right. It puts a lot of pressure here. And this was my idea in the game. I wanted to pressure the d6 pawn. Um, so what do we think uh, black is going to respond with to try and defend this d6 pawn? Black can play uh, e6-7 or bishop to uh, bishop to f8. So yeah, queen c7 or bishop f8 are both options that defend the pawn. Or, or a knight move. Yeah, or a knight move. And this is actually what uh, my opponent Samuel went with. And so he played in the game knight to b6. So now, how does this make knight to c4 look? Does it still make sense that I put my knight on this forward square? Well, you freed his position up a bit. Yeah, I kind of freed his position a bit. So I don't think knight c4 was actually such a good move. Um, for example, in the game, I simply castled. But this allows black to trade off that one piece that we were talking about. So earlier, I played knight d2, trying to avoid a trade of the knights. Uh, and then I brought the knight to c4, which actually kind of re-offered up the trade of knights. And so already, um, it's a lot better to have this go wrong in a training game, right, than in an actual game. And so this is a very important idea that uh, I'm going to look at a bit more afterwards. Uh, and I did, look at, I did look at afterwards, after the game, with my opponent, and that's a place I found that I could improve. And so this is really what these training games uh, are great for. You pair up with somebody who knows more uh, about you, more, uh, more than you, about a specific position, and maybe you more, know more than them in another position, and you can help each other out and learn a little bit more. But let's just see how this game continued. Uh, let's see if black continued to play accurately. So we saw a6, uh, of course, preparing the natural break of b5 for black. 
I played a4, trying to slow it down. Bishop f5. So, you know, like I said, with this knight out of the way on d7, black can find natural squares for his pieces. So this one makes its way to f5. I play rook e1. Queen to a5. So, of course, I'm, my idea is to try and, and get e4 through. And black is simply going to expand on the queen side. I played f3, again preparing e4. We saw queen to b4. Queen to e2. Uh, h6, bishop h4. Knight to d7. And so I think all of these moves by both players have been fine so far. But you'll notice that black's play has really gotten a lot more natural over the past uh, few turns, right? He's simply bringing his pieces to the best squares that are available to them. And meanwhile, I'm kind of uh, discoordinated, right? A little bit uh, lacking in, in my coordination. So he played knight to d7. And this is kind of daring me to play e4, right? Because uh, it looks like the bishop is trapped. Obviously, I can't take it right away due to the pin. But uh, he then played knight to e5. So attacking my bishop, allowing me the chance to take his bishop. And uh, here, I don't know, let's try and calculate and see what white should play. Should white take this bishop? Should white play something else? Yeah, so you get a pretty interesting position there, right? So let's let's try and calculate through. So we have knight or pawn takes bishop, knight takes bishop, queen takes, rook takes, rook takes, and uh, obviously bishop f8 there might not be such a great move. I don't know if you're still with me in your head, mm -hmm. but if bishop f8, there would be bishop e7. So it'd be winning a bishop. So you can calculate in your head, and it's quite a a narrow line is what we would say. Uh, black doesn't have many options. So we can get kind of close to the end. We see takes, 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 and king h7. And then uh, it's stuck with uh, my turn there. And so let's think. Uh, I can bring my other rook in the game. I could try to bring my knight in the game. I could uh, you know, maybe remaneuver my bishop, but I have to be careful because there's always threats of queen takes b2 now. And so what do you think the evaluation might be in that final position? Um, whether you want to play something like rookie one or something like knight e4 or something else entirely. I don't think white should take. Don't think white should take, so you don't like that final position that we were looking at? No. I think white should simply move out of the game first. Mm -hmm. And try something else, then black is more than white to move the bishop. Sure. So, can I ask why you don't like that final position for white? Where we have the two rooks for the queen. Well, sure. So, I mean, uh, the final position could happen after rook a e1. So we're doubling the rooks on, on the e file. Yeah, so black can take on b2. Sure, that's fair enough. Does anybody else uh, think otherwise? Well, it is actually a very forced line. Uh, we can almost guarantee that position after rook a to e1. Because it's a, it's a very narrow line, like I said. Sure. So, I mean, that, that is fair. Bishop a2, moving the bishop would keep your options open. Does anybody like the line after pawn takes bishop? I yeah? I, I think it has potential. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's definitely interesting. Well, I'm looking at the alternative, and bishop to a2. I mean, the, the, the bishop is not doing anything there, and it's, it's weak, so if you, if you yeah. bring it back, it's trapped behind all its own pawns, so it looks terrible. Yeah, so, so the bishop? you guys are thinking like I was. And so I decided this bishop, uh, I would rather have this bishop and get rid of my kind of weak bishop. Maybe I have some extra threats of taking on g6, and I would willingly trade off this queen uh, for the two rooks. Fortunately, though, Mario is actually closer to the truth here. And this is what I did in the game. And we can see it didn't turn out so well for me. Uh, so here I threw an f takes g6. And this does actually force king takes, 
because I saw that. Uh, uh, let's see, what did I see? Um, I thought for some reason that uh, Black would kind of be getting checkmated here. Uh, maybe you simply rook a to e1 and rook to e7. And ideas like this, or maybe rook e7 immediately. But uh, you know, there, there's g5 stuff. It's a little complicated, but uh, it did force king takes. But then it turns out after rook to e1, queen takes b2, simply knight e4. So these are all kind of the most natural moves. And we probably could have seen this position in our head uh, if we thought long enough. Is this the game? So yeah, this is what happened in the game. And it simply turns out that my king is going to be weaker than black's king, which is kind of strange to think about, because you know the black king has run all the way up to g6. But uh, thanks to black's kind of strong control of these dark squares, um, my attack kind of just fizzles out into nothing. Meanwhile, the knight and the queen and the bishop can all work together very well to kind of get at my king. Uh, so white's actually simply losing in this line. So before we continue, let's take a quick look at the alternative. Uh, so let's look at bishop a2. And now it's actually not so clear uh, what black should be doing. Maybe just bishop to d7 would be simplest. And uh, again, I don't think black can really be worse here, because he's traded off one piece, and really his other pieces are still on their ideal squares, right? So yeah, I mean, queen c2 would be fine. Uh, maybe something like bishop g3 also makes sense, indirectly putting pressure here. But uh, at least the game would, would keep going, right? Sometimes it's best just to, to keep your options open like this. Um, I was also thinking of uh, the pawn to f4, ultimately. Here? No, not, not well, not yeah. Real, oh, so yeah, bishop a2? Yeah, then, then I come to the other bishop. OK, then do that. It might not work yet, but the thought would be. So yeah, this is, a, this is a very common idea in the Benoni, actually. So you're on the right track. Uh, Where's that? Well, to g4 would be one option. Mm -mm. And maybe we're thinking about playing f5 and kind of forcing the issue before you're ready to push e5. Okay, so h3? So yeah, h3. It's understandable. I'll come back to, let's see. I'm going to give a check. King h1, I guess, and, and then I'll come back to f6. And this is, yeah, this is actually pretty interesting. Yeah. Um, there might be e5 here. I honestly haven't calculated that far. But yeah, so white has ideas, is the yeah. point. You know, the game keeps going. It looks precarious. <laughs> but yeah, it, okay. it would probably be a better line than, than the game. So let's get back to this position. Well, you, were, you were to show what, what bishop to a2 was going to happen. So that's what we were looking at, was bishop a2, bishop d7, and then you suggested f4. And then that's it. Okay. Yeah, so that's where we were. Um, so yeah, this is the position we got in the game, however. And after bishop d4 check, the king moved to h1, and the knight comes into e3. You can kind of see how, uh, you know, thanks to, to this control over f6, my pieces can never really coordinate against the king. There's like one check, but the king could actually just move, and it would be totally fine. And my rooks are kind of interfered from, from each other by this annoying knight. And white is simply lost here. I, I tried bishop f2 to defend against the mate threat. Then I took on e4, or d5 rather, rook g8, and we saw, unfortunately, the ends came pretty quickly. Um, so yeah, so knight takes here. And then I had my one trick where if black moved out of the way, what would white do? Uh, knight to f6? <laughs> yeah, there's, there's a funny checkmate yeah. here. But of course, my opponent noticed and played uh, queen, to w queen to a1 instead, simply cutting off the f6 square and preventing the mate. And then I think I might have resigned here, or at least I should have. Uh, so yeah, that, that was that game. And so after the game, this is the most important part. You can't just play the game. Uh, I was talking with Samuel, and we went back to what he thought was the critical point, which was this knight c4 move. This is allowing a black you know, all of this uh, play, all of this, uh, the single piece trade, and then from that, uh, the natural play with the rest of his pieces. And so he originally thought after knight b6, I should play something like knight a3 to try to keep the piece on. But then, you know, we got to talking and we said, well, okay, why is white putting the piece on c4 in the first place? And we came up with a couple alternatives. We thought about maybe a4, 
simply biding your time. Maybe with the idea of playing a5, so you could prepare this move. And uh, the play might continue something natural like a6, uh, you know, a5. And just doing this very quickly. And now, you know, black is going to have b5 ideas. And, uh, but white is at least, you know, not freeing black's position, right? This bishop's going to be stuck back here. This knight might come to e5, but it might not be able to stay there forever. And the game could, could continue a lot more naturally. And then we said, okay, well, if I'm playing a4, why don't I instead just castle and, you know, take things in a more slow direction? Something like h6, bishop h4, knight e5. And we see, you know, a very normal position now, uh, where neither side is really committed to anything. Black is very narrowly uh, keeping enough squares for all his pieces, but you see, can kind of tell, okay, maybe he has one knight too many, right? This knight kind of just seems in the way. And so this is the improvements that we, we thought about, uh, that we made. And then let's see how this changed our play in the second game. So we played the exact same line. Um, so the line kind of begins at bishop g5. And, uh, okay, so yeah, bishop g7, e3, we follow the same line up until the critical point here, bishop e2, and so last game, uh, this is where I think I played knight c4, in this game I chose uh, to castle, we saw knight e5, so bringing the knight to the natural square, of course now definitely I wouldn't want to play knight c4, and here instead I played the simple h3. So this is a lot like the lines we were looking at in the game, right? Uh, white doesn't commit to anything just yet, and kind of forces black's hand to try something, because if black doesn't really get something going, eventually I'm going to actually come through with this plan, right? And I can make plenty of useful moves in the meantime, useful moves that don't commit to anything, such as like rook e1. Uh, I could even play bishop f1 if I so chose. I can play queen to c2. Uh, I can eventually play e4, and really hold my cards close to my chest until I want to play this f4 move and break through in the center. So because of that, and because of this annoying pin as well, black chose to play, well, first a6 and a4, which is a pair of moves that are often traded off, and then h6, forcing my bishop uh, back. So I came back to h4. Of course, I wouldn't want to trade. I just want to keep this pin, keep this knight kind of locked down. Maybe I have some threats of playing this in the future. And so black continued with g5, and so bishop g3. So what do you think of black's idea here, playing h6 and g5? Uh, there's some benefits and there's some drawbacks, and so let's try to think about what those might be. Well, uh, he gained more space on the king side, but he also opened up his king more, more bottom. So yeah, that's one way to put it. So he has more space on the king side, and the benefit of that space is it breaks this pin. And it might eventually give his bishop some, uh, some room here, his light squared bishop. Uh, the downside, you said, is it opened his king up. Another way to put it is it made weaknesses, right? So specifically, uh, this f5 square might end up being weak, uh, as well as this pawn might become a hook. So are you guys familiar with the term uh, of hook? So what do I mean by that? I mean, eventually, if I play a break like f4 or h4, my pawns have something to latch onto, something to hook onto in this g5 pawn. So if I want to open files around his king, I can do something like f4, and I'll have the option to open the file by taking this pawn. And so uh, what do you think would happen if black played a nonchalant move, uh, like rook to b8, kind of biding his time? What should white play here? So you could try something like f4, but that's pretty committal. Uh, I'm more of a fan of playing useful moves uh, until I'm sure that the time is right to play f4. So I don't think the time is quite yet right. I think there are still more useful moves that I can kind of include. Well, a5 would clamp down the queen side. Yeah, a5 might be a useful move, uh, clamping down on the queen side. Um, yeah, rook c1 might be useful, though I might like this rook on a1. Yeah. So if b5 ever gets played, I can kind of invade. There's one move I have in mind specifically. It's kind of a preventative move as well. Just e4. So yeah, e4 is totally fine as well. It's got a similar idea to the move I was thinking of. I was thinking, why not queen to c2, right? 
So of course, the black bishop would love to come to f5. And so why not play queen to c2 to prevent that? And maybe with the future idea of bringing my bishop here and kind of invading along the light squares, right? That's one idea uh, for white that I was actually familiar with. So of course, black, because of this, chose to play bishop f5 immediately, not giving myself the opportunity. But now this is where uh, that other idea came into play. So one drawback of bishop f5 is you're putting the bishop on a loose square, right? A square where it's not defended. And this gives white some more opportunities, some more advantages to break through immediately. So that's where this other idea of f4 comes into play. So I decided to play f4 here because I thought the time was right due to this bishop being undefended on, along the f file. So I'm going to gain some time thanks to this uh, nasty bishop. So black chose to play with uh, pawn takes f4 and rook takes f4. And what do you think the best square is for this bishop now? Where should it move to? Probably h7. Probably h7. Why do you think that? Well, that's a very good diagonal. Well, sure, yeah. It can stay along this diagonal. But why h7 specifically instead of something like g6 or uh, even maybe d3? Well, sure, but it defends more squares on g6, right? Mm -mm. So you think h7 or g6, maybe? Either one? Yeah. Anybody disagree? I was thinking of g6, but looking at d7, that doesn't get very exciting. But... Yeah, so you could come to d7, but I, I think this is the diagonal yeah. that black wants to stay on. Um, so there's actually a big difference between g6 and h7. So I'll let you guys try and spot it. Well, G, bishop to G6, it just, it, it's not blocking the black king um, like escape square. Sure. So on G6, the black king would have you know that luft square, that, that free square to move to. Uh, but it's a lot more important than that, actually. Uh, white has some very concrete ideas that black needs to stop. Sure. So yeah, in a lot of ways, g6 uh, is a lot more natural. But the thing is, the bishop has to go to h7 here, or else black is actually simply losing. Uh, and the reason for that comes after bishop g6, bishop h4. And all of a sudden, this annoying pin that black works so hard to break out of is right back, uh, right back in the game. And this pin is actually almost impossible to break out of, uh, looking at the game. And so this is why the bishop should go to h7. So how does that make a difference in this line? What if the bishop were on h7 here? What could we do? Well, then you could play knight to g6. Yeah, that's right. So this g6 square was actually needed for the knight. So bishop h7, bishop h4. Then there would be this uh, annoying knight g6 move, and I would be forced to kind of take, right? Or else I would lose the piece. I could play something like rook to c4, but I mean, that's, that's really no different. Yeah, because I guess they are, the knight is more effective because there is a um, knight to d7, but the, the knight still fits between them. Yeah, so white or black might have to try something like knight to d7, but it turns out it's, it's very easy to add attackers here. Yeah. Something like queen to f1, uh, something like knight to e4 maybe is, is coming as well. And it's going to be really, really tough to try to break out of this pin. And so we can see what happened in the game, actually. Knight to d7. I played queen to f1. Uh, he took on e3, uh, trying to get some counterplay, I guess. Uh, I simply play knight to c4. Queen to e7, trying to keep an eye on this pawn and you know trying to sack the exchange to kind of free up his position. Uh, here I played king to h1. And this move is actually kind of a big mistake, but uh, I think instead probably something like bishop g4 would have made a lot more sense. So I'm eyeing up the, one of the last defenders of this knight, and there's really nothing black can do here. I could also just take this rook, of course, and this would be very, very pleasant for, for white, I think probably even winning. Uh, in the game, though, I played king uh, h1, black took here, uh, I captured back, and black kind of missed a chance here to play bishop to e2 which would put an annoying pin on this knight. I would have to defend, and maybe black could simply uh, add another attacker. 
And this would have generated quite a lot of counterplay for Black, actually. In the game, he played Rook e8, uh, kind of missing this, which it's a 10 minute game. These mistakes are kind of going to happen. I played Knight to c3, uh, b5, uh, just kind of desperately trying to break out now. Takes, takes, Knight takes. Uh, the Knight comes to h5, sacrificing the Queen in exchange for this Knight g3 check. And uh, I go with Bishop takes d6, Knight to g3, Rook to f7. So this move was a big mistake. Uh, a lot of these past moves have kind of just been nonsense. Uh, because I think black realized that white should just be completely winning, and he was trying different things to try to break out. So here, almost every move wins for white. Uh, probably like rook to f2 might be the simplest, rook to f3, rook g4. Uh, I played rook f7, thinking black would take, and I would take, and this would be easily winning. Of course, I missed knight e2 check, uh, saving the knight, <laughs> and this was what was played. And we saw bishop takes f7, rook to e1. And some more kind of random nonsense moves. We were in time pressure by this point. And he eventually lost after hanging his knight on g3. So not the best finish to the game. But this wasn't the most important part. Uh, kind of the point of these training games were to work on these, these openings and try to understand them a little bit better. So once again, after the game, uh, it goes both ways. We looked back and tried to find improvements for black. And so up to this point, we thought black had actually played pretty naturally, right? Uh, he breaks this pin, making some weaknesses, yes, but uh, also giving himself some more space. And so bishop f5, f4, takes, takes. Uh, this is what we decided, as I was describing to you, was the kind of fatal mistake. So after bishop h7, you know, we looked a little bit deeper. Uh, and so what do you think's going on here? Who would you rather be in this position? I'll tell you now, there's no really wrong answer, because uh, Samuel definitiv definitively declared that he would rather be black here, and black was doing fine, and I thought that white was actually probably doing a lot better. But uh, we'll, see, uh, we'll see the arguments for both sides. So you're asking what the best move is for white? Well, I'm just, who would you rather be? Would you rather be the player with the white pieces here, or the black pieces? That's white to move. Well, yeah. Really, in reality, it's it's kind of close to level. Yeah. I guess I'd prefer black. For black. Why is that? They have the two bishops. Well, I guess they both have the two <laughs> yeah. So it seems like black's pieces have, have kind of found homes, right, for the moment. Maybe this knight's going to be forced to move eventually, but for the moment, they, they are kind of safe. Well, the e3 pawn also is kind of vulnerable. So yeah, white's definitely not without weaknesses. Um, but white does have some good things going for him, right? He can't play bishop h4 immediately, well, but these threats aren't really I, going to go away. I'm not, I'm not convinced. If you go bishop to uh, h4, OK, you bring the knight back. Mm -hmm. You take the knight, OK. You bring the queen over. Sure, queen f1, but uh, oh yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay. So you would have to move this rook first. Yeah. Um, and then, then you know, you, you kind of have given up the bishops. But yeah, I mean, you could simply play queen f1 first, right? Uh, and you might follow up with something like bishop h4. And now there are legitimate threats against the, the knight. So that's kind of the thing is, is white has these concrete threats against f6 and against the king's side. Whereas if black can manage to hold, white has really given up quite a lot, right? He gave up uh, the ability to kick this knight away. He gave up kind of this weakness on, on the e-pawn. And so it's just going to be a matter if kind of black can weather the storm. And so we looked at quite a few lines here, actually. Knight to uh, g6 here looked OK. Yeah, so knight to g6 is what we settled on. Yeah. Uh, Black tried a variety of other things, though, Samuel. Uh, had, had quite a few ideas here. After queen to b6, there's actually a really crazy line I wanted to show. Uh, it looks like it's hanging uh, the two pieces for the rook. Black would con continue with taking. And now, actually, the best move here uh, is not to save the rook, not to try to defend the knight, not to bring the rook over to the king side, actually. it's Bishop h5, which is kind of a crazy idea. Giving up the rook with check, the king moves to h2. And now if you take this knight, uh, there's bishop h7. And so if the king were to move away, uh, there is checkmate. So you actually have to take this piece. And after queen takes c3, white ends up with a queen for two rooks <laughs> in a balance we've seen before. But uh, here, I think it would definitely actually favor white, thanks to how exposed black's king is and how safe my king is. Um, so yeah, that, that would be a, a really crazy line that the game could have gone down. 
But uh, we decided knight g6 was probably the best line for black. And the most reasonable, actually, in a practical game. So simply rook to f3 looked best for white, defending this pawn, keeping some pressure. Uh, the black knight might come back to e5, and now we come back to f2, avoiding the repetition. Uh, knight f to d7, so black does actually want to get this knight out of danger, kind of. Now we're looking at bringing more pieces into the attack, and you can kind of see the flow of the game, right? So white's going to put all his pieces over here and attack black's king, and black is going to try to defend to the best of his ability. And so this is why I, I kind of preferred the white pieces. Is I like to be more the attacker in, in these situations than, than the defender. But, uh, you know, it's not to say black is, is worse here. Uh, although, if you look at the specifics, maybe he is. But uh, if black can hold on, then black should have a very comfortable game. Did, did you have to look at this on a computer to see? So yeah, we were analyzing with a computer, yeah. It's, first, I would recommend going over it without a computer, looking at the practical choices, and then it, it's helpful to, to see the, uh, the, the, true, uh, the truth in, in the matter, which the computer can, can sometimes give. Not always, but sometimes. Uh, c4 is a very natural move for black to try, uh, trying to get this knight into d3. Um, we saw, so maybe rook f4. Knight to g6, the same idea, but in this case, the white uh, bishop can now take it. And we looked at bishop takes, but decided maybe bishop h4 was just winning after something like queen to e5. Uh, something like knight to f6 in, in some manner uh, looked actually quite, quite nice for, for white. So that's how we came up with uh, bishop here. So on bishop h4, that would be g5. And yeah, this is just kind of a crazy position we decided on. We didn't go too much further than this because uh, it would be a little bit silly too. Uh, <laughs> not so much productive. Because the point of these training games were, were to work on the openings. But uh, definitely interesting stuff. So you can kind of see how in two short 10 minute games, uh, both players made pretty significant improvements to their repertoire, right? Uh, as for me, I learned a lot about uh, when it's correct to play knight c4 and how usually knight c4 isn't going to be the best choice when black can simply respond by offering a trade. And as for Samuel, I, I think he learned quite a bit about this f4 break and what the specifics of it, when it's good for white, when it's not good for white, and uh, what to do and to be careful about this pin. So two short games and actually quite a bit learned. So I think this is a really great way to work on your openings especially is doing these training games with, uh, with a friend. Uh, with that in mind, I did give Samuel the white pieces a couple times. Uh, and we played a Karo Khan. So let's take a look at uh, the Karo games and how they went. I'm blowing by all these moves because they are well-known theory. Um, so this is just the classical uh, Karo Khan. Usually white plays queen to d5. And so the idea of this is black doesn't want to get check doesn't want to get checkmated and white wants to checkmate black. So very often black will bring this queen to d5 and offer a trade of queens and go in for an end game, where maybe this h pawn is a little bit weak, this d pawn might end up being a little bit weak, and uh, black's probably not getting checkmated if he trades queens, which is how the very natural bishop e3 comes to light. Uh, so this is a pretty common line. Uh, bishop e3, I would say, is the first move of the line uh, against the, the classical caro. And the idea is simply, you're putting a bishop in the way, so the queen on, uh, the queen on e4 won't actually be able to trade. And so I knew that uh, black actually had a few options here. I knew queen to b5 was maybe the main one, but I had looked at that line before and I didn't really like it so much. I knew uh, b5 was another choice, and I kind of just assumed black could do something natural like rook a to d8 as well. In this game, I, I decided to play b5. Uh, if you're a longtime fan, you might recognize this game from my match against Jonathan Trance. Uh, if not, don't worry about it. Don't check it out, because I lost. <laughs> uh, so knight to e5. A very natural move. So uh, b5 kind of weakens this square a little bit. Knight e5 takes advantage of that. It also threatens to start pushing these pawns up the board. I played the same move I did against Jonathan. I played b4. We saw g4 in, in response. I responded with knight e4. And then Samuel deviated from the game I had against Jonathan. Um, so after rook to g1, uh, what do we think is going on here? Uh, so what are white's ideas, first of all? They're a little bit easier to see. Yeah, so he's just very naturally going to push this pawn to g5 and give checkmate if I don't do something about it. Uh, would it be useful to 
chase away the knight first. So yeah, yeah. his real idea is f3. Because if you played, uh, let's say, g5 right away, maybe I could get away with taking it with, uh, I don't, perhaps with, with the bishop, I'm going to say. <laughs> um, and yeah, or, or maybe with the knight. So it would be useful for, for white to actually push the knight away and then go ahead and continue with g5. And this would be quite strong for white. So in the game, I decided I had to do something pretty immediate, or, or else I would risk being checkmated. So I decided to try to break with c5 right away. Um, so I'm actually just continued with f3. And so I decided you know, c takes d4 here was really my only chance. Uh, white responds with bishop takes d4. It wouldn't make too much sense to trade off these pieces, uh, simply because it makes my defensive task a little bit easier. Now this pawn can never come to f4, and I can kind of keep control over g5. Uh, sure, so queen a5. <laughs> a little bit better. Um, yeah. So you can take it, but the knight is hanging. Yeah. So uh, f3 is actually the best move. So after c takes d4, of course, white doesn't take the knight. He instead takes the pawn, defending his own knight. Forcing my knight to move away. I chose this square, but unfortunately this falls to a tactic after bishop takes, queen takes, and knight d7. And so this is kind of where the game lost interest. So, I mean, white uh, converted very well here. Simply pushed his pawns. And checkmated me pretty horribly. Uh, pretty mean of him uh, to give checkmate like this. But, you know, that part of the game wasn't as important, right? The important part was the opening and the early middle game, the strategy for both players. And so once again, uh, we looked at this line afterwards, which is the way, where the uh, real improvement comes. So I played b5, he played knight e5. And it turns out we think this b4 move probably wasn't quite the best, uh, simply due to you know, white's pawns coming down the board so quickly. Um, and knight e4 actually is completely busted uh, because of this rook, rook g1 move. And there's really nothing black can do here to stop the pawns from coming down. So we went back here, and after knight to, D, knight to e5, we looked at uh, a few different options for black. And so what do you think some options might be, besides this b4 idea, to try to slow down uh, white's plans? Bishop d6. Bishop d6? Is that what you said? Yeah. Yeah, so what's the idea here? Get rid of the, the knight. So you want to get rid of the knight, but there's an important line you have to look out for, which is f4. Yeah. So what are you going to play after f4? Um, not take the knight, maybe, uh, well, knight e4 is interesting, threatening, um, threatening g3, possible. OK, so knight to e4, maybe. Uh, what happens, one, I just kind of want to play this anyways. What happens if rook h3, though, preparing g4? Is that better than uh, g1, rook g1? So rook g1, uh, I don't know. I, I thought maybe the knight could plant on f3 and reroute. Okay. So I, I just wanted to defend the g3 square. I mean, okay, you could play something like this, but the, the fact is, you know, these pawns are, are really coming down the board, right? And f6. f6. Not a very pretty move, but... Uh, oh, yeah, a lot of weaknesses here. Even knight to g6, maybe. But okay, knight to d3 is a little bit easier to, to calculate. And yeah, I mean, th these moves are, are coming anyways. So you need something more direct to stop... Uh, Stop White's ideas. You're on the right track, though. This f4 move gives up uh, control over a couple key squares. And so how do we want to use those squares? That's exactly what I was thinking. Uh, so the queen could come to e4. And then what's the follow-up here? What if 
you know, white simply defends the, the bishop. Okay, maybe rookie one wasn't the best example move. You're right. Bishop b4 would be possible. Uh, I'm not sure that would make the most sense. So what if something like uh, queen f2, we'll say. Yeah, knight d5. This is, the, this is the big idea, is we can kind of force this bishop back and get our pieces into uh, pretty good positions here. Uh, with that in mind, I'm trying to think how play might continue here. Uh, it's a little tough. Um, yeah, I, I'm not so sure. For one, you could actually take this knight now. You could, con you could consider uh, doing something like this um, and playing maybe queen to b4. And all of a sudden, you have a lot of counterplay, right? Yeah. Uh, like this is threatened, this is threatened, and uh, basically the idea is you get your pieces on very good squares, and white has to waste a lot of time. Um, other than that, I'm not sure what else uh, white might try. Of course, this line would be even easier. You're just going to trade the knight for the bishop. And then if uh, you ever need to, you can actually go ahead and trade this bishop for this knight as well. And then it's pretty hard to checkmate black. So that's kind of the problem with f4 here, which is the most natural move. But it gives up this e4 square, and queen e4 is actually quite good for, for black. So we started looking at other things, right? And maybe something like knight to d3 uh, could be the best move. But then we find out uh, after something like a5, very natural, black just continues his attack. Um, maybe this isn't so, so good for white either, right? His attack is coming a lot slower. Uh, in fact, let's see, I think I analyzed some other lines here as well. Okay, maybe just a5. And you can try something like g4. Uh, but let's see here. What's going on? Hmm. So I yeah, maybe queen e4, but uh, there is f3. This is usually well, the problem. Now, but yeah. okay. Well, here, there's, there's also f3. Uh, okay. So yeah, I don't know, something like a5. And you know, the attack might continue on both sides. You could probably consider playing a knight e4 here. It's a little bit better. Uh, you still have to play something like this. And let's see. Let's see, there's a lot going on here. It's, it's tough to kind of calculate on the fly. But it would be certainly be a bit more interesting. Um, other moves we looked at were bishop c1, but uh, maybe it's fine to just play c5 here, taking advantage of this loose knight now. And so yeah, this was kind of the improvement uh, that we made for black, possibly, and an improvement for, for white as well, instead of f4, something like knight to d3. And so kind of a lot was learned from there, right? Uh, we played one 10-minute game, analyzed it afterwards, and we learned uh, that you know, this bishop d6 idea is very important. It's very important to learn how to kick this knight immediately. And it's very important for white not to give up this e4 square quite so quickly, uh, especially when queen e4 is possible, because it allows black to get his pieces on the very natural squares. So let's see how we implemented those ideas in game two here. Uh, so we played the same line. And we got to the same position, so bishop b3. And so I decided to take those ideas that we learned from the previous game and try to apply them here. And so I just played a natural move, rook a to d8. And I wanted to see if I could apply these uh, ideas in a slightly different position. Um, black or white played the same way with knight e5. And I tried the same idea with bishop to d6. And here, actually, white kind of fell in for the, for the same trap with this f4 move. So of course I tried uh, queen e4, rook e1, simply knight to d5, bishop c1, and we went in for a queen trade. I took on e5, uh, white also captured on e5. Of course it would be a mistake to play the natural uh, d takes e due to this tactic, right? The discovery. So because of that we played rook takes e. And now what do you think about this end game? Who's doing better here? Sure, so the knight has a good outpost. Yeah, I just think that maybe black is better than better placed in the bishop. Black stopped uh, white's attack, and I think you know, black is more comfortable. 
Yeah, so okay. Black has a good knight, so that's why you're saying black might be better. Any other thoughts? So yeah, that's the big thing, is the black pawns are all kind of close to home with a lot of different uh, options to kind of defend themselves, whereas these three pawns in particular are all pretty far advanced, and it's, uh, white's actually going to have a tough time defending all of them. And so for that reason, I would definitely say black is doing quite well here. White's rooks are more active than black's rooks. Are. Well, it depends on what you mean by activity. Uh, this rook is centrally placed, but what is it really accomplishing? Right? It's attacking e6 and d5, which are both always going to be well defended. And uh, perhaps it's even going to be vulnerable to some knight g4 move later on. So I simply played knight to f6 here. And after rook to d3, I had the simple idea of, of doubling along the d file. First I inserted, I think, b6, keeping the white rook out of a5. And we can see now uh, white felt the need to go for c4, trying to break through in the center, uh, which would get rid of one of his weaknesses, which is why he's trying to break through. But black plays very simply and just uh, threatens to double. And white felt the need to actually play rook to e1 here. And so what do you think black should do? There's a couple options. Wow, you've got a free so, pawn over there. H4. See, right. this pawn is simply hanging, yeah. right? So that's what I played in the game. I, I just took the pawn. but. White actually came up with some ideas after that. So there's a better move here for black. Better than just taking. Well, double up the rooks then? Yeah, that's exactly right. So you double the rooks, um, force white to make some concession uh, to defend. He just wasted a tempo. Yeah, he wasted a tempo. We got a rook in the game. We can even play something like c5 here if we really want to. Or we could just take immediately now. Uh, instead, though, I did capture this pawn. But this ran into some threats after something like g4. We saw knight to f6 and g5. What's wrong with um, knight takes f, f4? Oh, uh, the, the bishop oh, yeah. defended it, yeah. Um, so now where do we want to put our knight? Limited options, actually. Uh, a4. A5. H5, you mean? Yeah. yeah, so this would be the best square. Yeah. Why is that? Well, sure. On e8, though, you're looking to come, come around. But then the rook can come over. Rook can come over. Right, so that's the main thing. Is on h5, the knight can uh, yeah. sufficiently block the file to keep the king safe. Right. Um, and so black would actually still be doing well after knight h5. Not as well as if he inserted this rook d8 move, but uh, still pretty well. In the game, I played knight to e8, which of course now white is actually generating some, yeah. some pretty serious threats. I tried g6. Uh, to give my, my king some space. He played the other rook over to h1, threatening actually checkmate. So I kind of played uh, f5 uh, out of necessity. This was really my only choice to kind of save my king. So he captured it. I captured with my knight. And after check, uh, king g7. So somehow none of my pieces are, are hanging just yet. You might see this bishop h6 move, but thankfully this rook in h8 would then be hanging. And so I would barely survive here. And in most lines, it turns out I, I'm actually barely surviving. So I think black is OK here, but definitely not, not any better. Sorry, what was that? Go back and push the pawn. Okay. Yeah. So you can do this, but now the point is I can come up and my knight can kind of block. Uh, I think this is actually probably very good for white, though. Uh, if you play a simple bishop f4, uh, I think this is actually causing a lot of. Sorry, what was that? That's what he did in the game. Uh, but this would be, this would be better, uh, because you're simply bringing this bishop into e5, and then this knight on g7 isn't going to feel very safe. Uh, black is maybe actually lost here. But you know, again, it's a 10-minute game. We spent most of our time in that early middle game part, because that's what we were trying to improve. And so mistakes made on both sides, definitely. Um, so we saw bishop g5 here. And after some shuffling, um, I managed to play knight f8 and kind of consolidate. And here my opponent actually ran out of time. Uh, but black should probably win this endgame, although definitely not easily. So uh, what did we learn in this game? Let's, let's go back. So this game was mostly about this f4 move, right? This was the big mistake uh, for white. 
So let's try and find something better for white here. So this is, this is how it can kind of go in these games, is the person who loses uh, tries to find out why they were worse out of the opening or out of the middle game, and then make an improvement. So in this game, uh, it was my opponent who was a little bit worse. So f4, definitely not the idea. What can white do instead? So f3 would be a kind of preventative move, yeah. but it turns out white doesn't actually need to play f3, right? Uh, as long as he has the pawn on f2, let's just waste a tempo. If I ever play queen e4, he'll always have f3 in response, okay. right? So there's no kind of need to spend a, spend a tempo doing this. So what about g4? Yeah, g4 would be interesting, but uh, you do have to be careful. I think I can just take this knight. OK. I mean, you have to understand, though, this is a, a pawn sacrifice. And so you have to be very, very careful if you're going to play this way. Yeah. Um, I think, uh, actually, white does have to deal with this problem of this knight somehow. So what are his choices to uh, stop black from winning this pawn? Play knight to c4. Knight c4 would be interesting. Um, so you're attacking this bishop. Let's see. Black probably has a lot of options here. Um, maybe knight e4 might be a good move. Maybe not, though. OK, let's say bishop c7. Just simple. Which you solved the problem of the knight. Yeah, so you can continue with your normal ideas here. Um, perhaps, though, this isn't the best square for the knight. You're on the right track. I think knight to d3 would be a better version of this. Um, bishop c7 I don't think is, is quite so accurate. I don't know if black has to spend that tempo. But yeah, so I think knight, d, knight to d3 would be a better version of this. Maybe knight c4 is actually also good, though. Um, against knight d3, I was thinking black could probably try something like rook e8. Maybe something similar would happen against knight to c4. And uh, let's see, do you want to continue with g4 still? Yeah. All right. Let's take a look here. So maybe knight e4. So you got to be careful of this fork, right? Yeah. So if you do want to kick the knight, you have to play something like rook g1 first. Rook h3, is, that's totally playable as well. Um, and let's see, what can I do? <coughs> yeah, sure. Maybe I can play uh, a bishop e7 now, kind of retreating. And OK, it's a game. I can also probably play c5 here. Uh, and this is the, the big break that black really wants to get through. And these lines actually all look very similar to knight to d3. And so something like g4. And black's idea is he wants to break in the center to kind of counter all of white's play. Uh, so yeah, knight c4 definitely playable. Um, and so yeah, it might go something like this, where white is actually really breaking through. But black has enough counterplay thanks to the open central files uh, against the white pieces. So we could see takes, maybe h6, and bishop d4. And black would be doing quite well here. So white would probably have to play a bit better. Uh, maybe, let's see, what else can white do here? I've kind of forgotten. Something like queen to d2, uh, just simply uh, playing naturally. Although there's knight e4, maybe. Uh, yeah, I'm not so sure. So maybe, uh, actually, let's see. So OK, that's, that's right. So I decided, we decided that maybe knight d3 and knight c4 aren't the best. Because black does get this counterplay in the center. But there's actually a very, very strong move for white here that we haven't mentioned yet. It's kind of unnatural. C4? Yeah, c4 is the move. And so why is this so good? 
Uh, let's take a look. Well, first of all, what happens if the black queen comes to a5? So it's kind of out of the game, but it can always kind of jump back in. There's some real problems here, though. Um, so the problem is f4. Right? So we no longer have this queen d5 idea against f4. So white can simply solidify this knight and continue very quickly on the king's side. Um, with that in mind, the most natural move seems like check, right? So we can check this king. Uh, the king will simply run away, though. And now the problem is, uh, what do we do next? Right? Maybe you won't yeah, take the knight. But here is where, uh, unfortunately, white's trick lies. So white has a, a good move in response to this line. Oh yeah, if, if you're in the knights, please go ahead and, and uh, start that problem. round up. <laughs> You know, okay. I want to know the, the All right. Answer. So, okay. Really quickly, <laughs> okay. White can play f3 here, okay. forcing this queen back, and then taking this bishop. Uh, okay. So yeah, this line would actually be lost for for Black. And so because of that, you know, we found an improvement for White. We also found an improvement for Black here. Turns out instead of Bishop d6, something like Knight to d7 is a lot better. And the reason is we have this extra square for the Queen, and we can keep these threats uh, against the Knight and keep this g5 square under control. So. Any questions about what we covered today, or this game specifically? All right. So in summary, um, what this lecture was kind of about is it was to show you kind of the method of which uh, you can play training games against somebody. It's a very fun way to improve. And it can be very helpful, especially with your opening repertoire and that early middle game stage, where you're trying to find out your plan and where your pieces go. So hopefully you learned a little bit about the Benoni and a little bit about the Caro today. But it's supposed to be a method you can kind of take home and employ yourself, uh, to personalize to, to yourself, to kind of work. It's a great way to train. It's a great, uh, great way to get better. And with that in mind, that's going to be all for me tonight. So thank you guys for joining me here. Thank you guys for watching on YouTube. And uh, I'll see you next week on the Road to 2000s.